that the requirement of a bishop and the requirement for a deacon has nothing to do with their ability, something to do uh, with their preaching voice. Hallelujah. Ooh, that's a bishop right there. That's a bishop voice. It has nothing to do with their administrative giftings. It has nothing to do with any of that. But he's saying that, that a bishop, a deacon, has to be sober. That, that he has to be vigilant. That he has to rule his own house well. It had nothing to do with his giftings, but everything was predicated on godliness. And that if a, a leader, a minister, doesn't have godliness, then they don't have a ministry. Ministry, leadership, means nothing without someone walking in godliness. And so if you want to understand godliness, and the Greek word is Eusebius, which literally means something, an inner force that is shown, an inner, an inner force going upward to God that is shown by words and deeds. That's what he's speaking of godliness. That godliness doesn't start with the outside, but it starts with the inside. And Jesus said this, he said, he said that out of the heart proceeds wickedness and proceeds uh, adulteries and proceeds uh, fornications and murders. He said out of the heart, he said, he said the inside defiles a man. And so godliness, this concept of godliness and this Greek word eusebius, it, it, it is talking about an inner force that is that manifests itself in words and deeds. That what happens on the inside eventually pierces and shows itself on the outside. That this can be seen in someone's vocabulary. And it's like they said, no matter how much Peter, no matter how much Peter was trying to act unholy, come on somebody. Uh, Peter was cursing Christian. Y'all not hearing me out there. He was cursing proper. They said, man, your speech is betraying you. They said, well, you were, they said, you were with Jesus. He said, man, I don't know the man. He said, no, you was with him. For your speech betrays you. You talk like him. And so he started cussing. <laughs> I know not the man. And then, then the, the rooster crows and he remembers the word of the Lord. And so what we're dealing with here is that the godliness, the internal force starts exuding and starts showing in our lifestyle not only our lifestyle but how we speak to one another how we speak to people in the world and our actions there ought to be godly actions godly attributes right because you imagine some seeing somebody slap somebody and then you see him slap them like whoa what are you doing and like oh no don't worry i'm a christian like <laughs> Hold on, your, your, your actions, your, your deeds are not reflecting Christianity. And, and, and I talked about it several months ago whenever the, the demons, uh, the, the demons uh, confessed Christ and they said, the demons said, we know you're the son of God. And Jesus said, hold your peace. Why? Because if your confession doesn't match your lifestyle, be quiet. 
And you're saying I'm the Christ, but the issue is what's happening in you. You're making it out to be a lie because even a liar can't tell the truth. So you're saying the right thing with the wrong spirit. And he didn't want his identity to get out there. Here it is by impure spirits. He said, if you ain't going to live it, just be quiet. Don't say you connected to me. Imagine, imagine blowing up on somebody at Starbucks. And then after you're done blowing up, you give them a church card. Here you go. We'd love to see you at Bible Center of Orlando. It's like, listen, I don't want that Christianity. I, I, the, the world is looking for people. See, they don't have a problem with Jesus. They have a problem with how people represent Jesus. They're looking for somebody that's willing to love. They're looking for somebody that's willing to live it. They're looking for somebody that's willing to walk it, talk it, live it, operate in it. And if the whole Bible, according to Jesus Christ, if the whole Old Testament, if the whole Septuagint, if the whole Torah, the law and the prophets, if everything hangs on love God and love your neighbor and your, as yourself, then everybody that professes to be a follower of this God has to reflect those same attributes. We ought to walk in the love of God. We ought to walk in the peace of God. We ought to walk in the joy of the Lord. We ought to walk as a difference and a distinct difference in this world. This is why that they were first called Christians at Antioch. No one in the New Testament called themselves Christians. The world called them Christians. So the question is, are we living the life where the world notices that we're Christians? Or do we have to announce it? Because in the scripture, the world announced it first. Man, you're, you're talking just like them. You are a follower of Christ. Amen? Um, culture messes. I'm making y'all nervous, huh? Am I making y'all nervous? I, 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 this is just edifying. I'm, I'm going somewhere, amen? Uh, imagine with me and I'll portray it this way there is a difference and, and you might want to write this down write this down in your phone write this down in, in your notepad there is a difference between liberty and freedom there is a difference between liberty and freedom in our modern day vernacular, we have made those terms synonymous, but there is a no noticeable difference. Number one, freedom literally means to be free without restraint. That's what freedom means, to be free without restraint. But the word liberty means to be free within certain guidelines and boundaries of the authority that freed you. Y'all going to throw me out of here on a Wednesday night. So Wednesday night. Liberty means to be free within certain parameters of the liberator that freed you. Freedom has no accountability, but liberty means you're accountable to the one that freed you. Okay. And because of the authority, this is what liberty means, because the authority freed you, it expects complete and total allegiance. That's what you call a liberator. Anyone with liberty has a liberator. And because of you having liberty, you owe your allegiance 
to the one that freed you. And Paul says this. He says, your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price. You do not belong to you once you come into the kingdom. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? <laughs> So it's like, it's like with the United States of America. In, in every school, they say, I pledge allegiance, right? They're, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Why are they saying that? Because the flag is a symbol of liberty. What, what was the Constitution? What did they promise? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? So, so the flag is the symbol of your liberty. And so... Every morning, those schools expect you to pledge allegiance. So, so, so freedom is to be free without restraint. Now, here's the problem with being free without restraint. The flag, I'm using the United States as an example. The flag represents the authority that freed us. Here it is, freed America, okay? Liberated from Great Britain. Right? So the flag is the visual representation of our freedoms. Watch this, guys. So because that flag represents that, we owe our allegiance as citizens of the United States of America to pledge that allegiance to that flag. What does this mean? It means that you are abiding by the laws of your liberator. Oh my goodness. Meaning I'm free according to the guidelines of my, that they set for me. What does that mean? That means that liberty means to be free within laws. So what, what does that mean? That means you can't just go kill somebody. But I'm free. Stop trying to control me. I, I, you can't just go steal from somebody. But, but I'm free. I know you're free. But the liberator said you can't do that. Is this making sense? So this is why we have laws. Because we have pledged allegiance to a, this country saying... Hey, I, I confess this as my country, so I'm going to live within the laws of this country. That's, that's what it is. I, I'm giving you an example. So, so liberty means to be free within certain guidelines of the authority that freed you. And so here's what I'm trying to show you. The problem with Christianity, listen to this whole sentence, the problem is that we come to church bound and we leave free. That's not how God intended it. We're we come to church bound, and we're supposed to leave bound. We're just bound to something different. When I came to church, I was bound to sin, but when I left church, now I'm bound to him. I just switched masters. Oh, my goodness. Ah, that's what Paul said. He said, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. Meaning, even if I wanted to do wrong, I can't. Because I'm receiving instructions from my liberator. And my liberator said, you go here and you go there. I'm just bound to something greater than this world can offer. Who the Son hath set free is free indeed. But look what Jesus has the audacity to say. He says, take my yoke upon you. Oh my. Woo. I'm free. I'm free by the blood. I'm free by the name. He said, I know. Now put a yoke on now. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? A yoke? A yoke mean I can't control where I want to go. I know. Come on, are you kidding it? Take my yoke upon you. A yoke, that's, that's what you put on a cow. Come on, somebody. That's what you put on oxen. 
They go and plow, and they steer that yoke. Come on, somebody. So the problem with Christianity is that we, that we come to church bound, but then we leave not answering to anyone. Not answering to Jesus. So it's like, I'm free now, so I get to do my own thing. Da, 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 do, 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 do my own thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'll love you today. <laughs> I don't think. It's like, love your neighbor as yourself. You know what? I'll pass. Because I'm free. Watch this. This is important because what we have to understand, I'm giving a principle here, what we have to understand is that who in the world, so imagine coming into a kingdom, imagine coming into a kingdom, a physical kingdom, imagine you are wanted in this realm, but then there's a kingdom nearby and you hear about a gracious king. Okay, so I know all of y'all went to medieval times. Y'all just went to <laughs> y'all just went to medieval world. Like some of y'all got armor on. Some of y'all got come on, somebody y'all. <laughs> you got a sword on your hip. I know that's exactly where you went in your imagination. You know, like oh, I am coming into the kingdom. Amen. So imagine you're in this realm that's unsafe. People trying to kill you. The bandits are after you. Your life is miserable. You're tattered. But you hear in the, this kingdom over here nearby that, that this king is gracious. This king loves you. The, the, this king died and rose again. Are you serious? Yeah, man. He freed everybody in that realm. Are you serious? Yeah, watch this. So now I make my way into the kingdom. I believe in him. Well, all you got to do is believe. All you got to do is confess. I confess he's Lord. All you got to do is repent. I turn from my wicked ways. All you got to do is be baptized in his name. Where's the water at? I'll get baptized. All you got to do is receive his spirit. I'll receive his spirit. You receive his spirit. Now I'm in the kingdom. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it great being in the kingdom? Yeah, I got born again of the water and the spirit. I'm in the kingdom. And, and then they said, yeah, the king asked you to go and fulfill a ministry. Hold on, man. I'm free. Well, come on, somebody. I, I, I'm in his kingdom, but I ain't going to do what the king wants. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? And, and you're in the kingdom, but not taking instructions from the king. Do you know what that looked like in the Old and New Testament if you don't listen to the king? Imagine a king sitting on his throne. You walk in tattered and they say, I restore you. Now go and live in such and such house. And you say, hey, king, I... Wouldn't it be better? King, I, I ain't going to do that. You know what the king will say? Throw him in the dungeon. Jesus said that. Th throw him out. Well, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? So imagine, so I'm putting it physical for you. Imagine coming into the kingdom and you refuse to do what the king says. In the name of individuality, I'm free. You not understand it, that you are have liberty. You have been liberated. And so the liberator demands your complete and total allegiance. That's why it says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Because his kingdom, there will be no end. His kingdom is going to expand. So whether they want to praise him or not, one day everybody's going to bow. And so this concept of 
godliness is following God into such a place, here it is, that he influences your actions. That the king influences your behaviors, how you treat people, how you, how you love people, how you treat family. That, 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 is, that is a sign that you and the king are good when you're reflecting him. I make, I'm making y'all nervous today. Everything's all right. Everything's all right. I'm going somewhere. The Greek word for godliness is Eusebius. An inner force that works toward God that shows itself in your words and deeds. Now watch this. He said, if you want to understand the mystery of godliness, look no further than God in the flesh. Man, y'all. It didn't say the mystery of the Godhead. It said the mystery of godliness. The Godhead is not a mystery. There's only one God. There's one God. It's, it's that simple. One God. Everybody say one God. That's, that's not a mystery. It's, it's very plain. He said the Godhead is plainly seen by nature. It's a plain thing. There's one God. But he said there's a mystery to godliness because look what he's showing. If you want to look, he said this is how mysterious godliness is. Look at how God robed himself in flesh. Watch this, guys. Fully God and fully man. Listen. Listen. So much God, you couldn't believe he was a man. And so much man, you couldn't believe he was God. He said, that's what godliness looks like. Where someone is so in tune with God, you don't know what's them and you don't know what's God. That's what godliness looks like. Where you nice all the time, is that just them or is that God in them? They just love everybody. Never, never seen them hurt nobody. They just love it. Is that just their personality? Were, that, were they that way before they came into the kingdom? Or is that something from another world? It's a mystery. Where well, how Jesus lived out the glory on earth. It, it, they, they didn't know what aspects of him was God or was man. Because as God... He's saying to the storm, peace be still. As a man, he's asleep on the ship. Are you kidding it? Are, are you kidding it? Uh, you know, uh, as God, he's casting out devils. As, as man, he's snoring at night. So close proximity, you can't even separate any inkling what's flesh and what's spirit. It's so one. Isn't that powerful? He said, that's what godliness looks like. When people can't even tell, what, 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 where's the flesh? You just shake people's hand. You're always happy. He's saying, God bless you. You know, you, 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 you're loving people. You, 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 you represent Christ well. And people are, you confuse people because they're like, hold on, is that them? Like, you ever been so kind, people wondered if you was fake? Like, hold on, you can't love me like that. Like, you, you, ever, you ever had somebody tell you that they love you and, and it just made you suspicious? <laughs> been so hurt and bruised by the world and then you come into a church and they say I love you and you're like hey whoa hey you, you, you put you let's go let's go then no no I'm saying I love you come on let, let's go then let's, let, let's fight right now 
because it, that, that, that love is so pure, it's scary because where I came from, all I heard is when people told me they loved me, I was waiting on them to stab me in the back somewhere. That's what love looked like where I came from. Where I love you and there was punches and I love you and there was kicks and I, I love you and there was abuse. So when I come into the kingdom and somebody tells me they love me, I get a little nervous because I'm wondering what's the trick? How are, how are you trying to sabotage me? How are you trying to manipulate me? How are you trying to take advantage of me? And somewhere when you are walking so fine tunely with God, people start getting nervous around you. That's happened. I've seen it, seen it happen. I care, care for someone, invest in someone, love, 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 love. And at the end of it all, they're like, I don't really know if you like me. Huh? Like, no, I cared. Look, I've showed you not only in, in my words, but also in my deeds. But they're like, yeah, that's suspicious, though. And what happens? What happens? You know what happens? People self-sabotage. So they'll sabotage the relationship. Whew. They're like, you, well, well, what is the problem? You just love too much. I'm used to somebody slapping me every now and again. You didn't even slap me one time. Boy, come on, somebody. You, you, didn't, you didn't speak down to me one time. I, I didn't know if you was real. And what happens when you're raised in an environment like that or come from a relationship like that? You sabotage good connections because you have an anxiety and a paranoia on connections. Hmm. Isn't this the truth? Wave a hand if I'm helping somebody. Isn't this the truth? So, so what am I showing you? What, what I'm showing you is that if you want to see godliness, you look no further than the incarnation. God willing to become flesh. And, and it was difficult for you to measure what was God and what was man. Because as a man, he got tired. But then as God, he said, your sins are forgiven. And it confused these Sadducees because says, who can forgive sins but God only? They're seeing him take naps. They're seeing, oh, that, that's what, that was the confusion in the New Testament. How could God become man? That's what messed up the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. That's what messed them up. That's what messed the Jews up. How could God become man? They were trying to figure it out in the first century. They were trying to figure it out with councils. They had the Council of Nicaea. They had the Council of Trent. They had the Council of all of these councils, the Council of uh, Charlemagne. They had all these councils trying to delineate what's God and what's man. And they were trying to do it so much that they were creating false doctrines. <laughs> They're like, well, maybe he's like a... Like a junior God and, and someone said, no, 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 I see where the flesh stops. Maybe he was a demigod. No, 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 no. I see where the flesh stops. Maybe, 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 and the Gnosticism is born. Maybe he's, he's so much God. It's impossible for him to become man and, and, and because his godness would be corrupted by his humanity. And that was false doctrine. They said, no, 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 no. He's so holy. He could never become flesh. So, 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 so maybe he was, it was the appearance of flesh and that was false doctrine. The man couldn't recognize that, that God was fully God and fully man because it was such a, 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 an earth shattering idea for God to become flesh. So he says, so you want to process this? Okay, I want you to process it like this. When you receive his spirit, you receive the spirit of Christ. Now, if it's tough to understand fully God, fully man, now imagine God living on the inside of you. <laughs> oh, my. Come on, somebody. The, the creator in you. The Lord himself in your earthen vessel. What? How do we wrap our minds around that? But I noticed that no one wants to make a council 
about how God has come in us. Because that's, that's too complex to grab. We, we, because why? It's dealing with us. And we'd rather deal with God than deal with us. Come on, somebody. I want to know where the flesh stops and where the spirit starts and, and God, but in me? I notice there's no counsels on trying to delineate how God is in man. As Jesus said that I will send the comforter to comfort you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. It's amazing that we have the power. This is where you see the godliness. We have the power to walk. Here it is. Here it is. In the spirit. What? I'm flesh and bone. But he said that I will come in you so well, I will dwell in your temple so well that you will have the ability to walk in the spirit. But, but I'm living on earth. How am I walking? I know it's the mystery. <laughs> Look no further than God manifesting himself in the flesh if you want to understand godliness godliness is you living out God's will God's intentions God's motives God's influences in the earth that's what godliness is hmm is that powerful oh, that's that's that 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 is that is powerful the Eusebius, that's the Greek word, the Eusebius, that inner force that overtakes the deeds, it overtakes your outward behaviors. And that's what Jesus was. Jesus, according to the New Testament, was the express image of the invisible God. Meaning, if you wanted to see God, look at Jesus. Think about that. If you want to see God, look at his flesh. What? You want to see what God looks like? That's Jesus. Go ahead. Come on, Jesus. That's what God looks like. Because his godness, he needed to become flesh to become accessible. The word manifest literally means that he became tangible. That's what the Greek word means. That ephranothe means to be easily to, to be grasped, to be, God was able to be touched. See, godliness is not sticking up your nose being untouchable. Oh, that person's godly, look. No, I'll see you at the prayer meeting. Oh, child. Yes, I am godly. Continue to look on. I say amen. See, see, I'm showing you how Western culture penetrates our idea of godliness. Godliness is the, is the monk that never talks to anybody. Don't talk to him. He praying. Does he have any friends? No. He just prays all day. Like, does he have any, any family? He doesn't talk to anyone. He's just always praying. Look at him walking. 
Like, man, you look like Quasimodo. <laughs> You've been locked away with the tower in a tower. It's the hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> I'm walking around. God bless you. Hey, hey, come fellowship. I'm godly. Don't want to be tainted with you petty humans. It's amazing how man can become prideful. It's amazing that I've always thought of this like it's crazy how man can become prideful when somebody had to change their diaper. Hello? <laughs> Everybody here had their diapers changed. Isn't that amazing? Look, like, we don't even want to admit it. Like, you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a long time ago, though. You know, that was the old me. <laughs> it's like, how, how could we be prideful being such finite beings? Our, our life is but a vapor. And everything is to show our limitations and to show his unlimited nature. Show our weaknesses pressing into his strengths. And so, so we have a perception in the Western culture of godliness as if that's somebody that's never done anything wrong. That's never sinned. So, so what was it like when you was in the world? Oh, that's the unique thing about me. I was never in the world. Like, I thought you didn't get saved till you were like 17. Yes, 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 no. That's true, that's true. Why are you concerned? Are you trying to find something on me? You know, it's like, no, you know, they talk about their testimony and they're like, what was your testimony? I was lost and now I'm found. Hallelujah. Okay. Can you get specific? I'm trying to, I'm trying to grasp you. Oh, are you getting this? I'm I'm trying to grasp you. Oh, oh no, no. You know, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see I was in darkness, now I'm in the light, hallelujah. But what did you ever struggle with? Oh, you know, that's, hmm, so godly, I'm not sure. I'm just so holy, I'm not sure if I've ever, ever struggled. See, but you're not tangible, and that's not godliness, that's pride. See, the word manifest in the flesh, manifest, it literally means to be grasped. Godliness is supposed to be grass. It's supposed to be saying, listen, I was lost just like you. I suffered with depression just like you. I suffered, I battled with that temptation just like you. But let me tell you, God came on the inside of me. And God helped me to fight this battle. And I'm showing you how to live godly. It's not going to come from your flesh. It's going to come from his spirit. And he's going to help you to live this out. That's the word. Ep, epathon rothe, manifest in the flesh. It was justified in the spirit. He was justified in the spirit. So, so remember whenever. Jesus uh, was baptized by John, and he said, John said, I have need to be baptized of you. But, but Jesus said, let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness. Right? And, and John saw that, that, that spirit uh, descend up, up, up upon him. 
And so it's amazing that through his life with what Jesus did for us, he made a way for us to get to him. That just as he was, was justified and was taken up into glory, even so we will be taken up into glory because of what he did for us. But godliness is living under God's influence. If, if, if as much as lieth within you at all times, it's just you're always responding to God, a godly manner. Y'all not going to believe this. Y'all not going to believe this. I'm going to share this with you. Y'all not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell you it happened. <laughs> y'all, y'all waiting to hear what I'm going to say. Okay. But I'm going to tell you how much your, your pastor strives to walk in the, in the spirit. There was a time when there was someone just out of pure games and pure try to embarrass me. This was over a decade ago before I really started in ministry traveling. Actually, I, I did start traveling. I did start traveling. It was just before I was traveling as consistently uh, as I, I would later. But there was a bunch of people around, and this person was, like, intimidated by me. So when everybody got around, he reached back his hand, and he slapped me in the face in front of everybody. Now. (laughs) Now. I don't know if it's possible. But I believe my ears turned red. (laughs) But you know what I did? I said, God God, God bless you and just laughed it off and went, went about my business. Let me tell you something. That, my friend, is what you call the fruit of the spirit, self control. This was, so this was over a decade ago. But godliness is being able to live godlike, Christ-like, watch this, under stressful conditions. Because it is so easy, it is so easy to, you ever thought you was real spiritual until you got a phone call you didn't like? You're like, yo, we had church. Pastor preached on the language of scars. My God, have mercy. Pastor preached on this. Pastor preached on that. I'm up. I'm up. I'm up. You get that phone call. You're like, what's up? What's up? What's up? Don't say it again. Don't don't say it again. Don't say. You thought you were so spiritual, and God's like, uh, that, that, that's what you need to work on. Think about Jesus being punched and slapped and beaten, and he was a lamb dumb before his shears. He opened not his mouth. Could you imagine all these false accusations coming at him? Peter didn't know what to do whenever they came for him in the garden. He picked up his sword and he was like. And he thought he was doing right. He was, now, you know, you know, if he knows how to hold a pole. He don't know how to hold a sword. He knows how to hold a fishing pole. He don't know how to hold a sword. He knows how to hold a fishing net. He don't know how to hold a sword. So I don't know how off you got to be to cut somebody's ear off. I don't know how you swung. Because if you swung like that, you ain't cutting somebody's ear off. How did you swing, Peter? That's what I'm going to ask him when I go to heaven. 
how did you swing that sword? Because <laughs> he had to do something like a, how you swing it, get his ear, but miss his body. Like, I don't understand. But look what he says. Look what Jesus says. He says, listen, man, if I wanted to, I can pray for 12 legions of angels to come down. My goodness, that's powerful. See, godliness is when you have authority to destroy somebody. My goodness. And you just keep your mouth shut. It's like, I, I could get you. You think you're getting away with it. Come on, somebody. And I'm talking about when, when, when things arise. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. Now, if, anytime, if there's abuse, please shout it from the mountaintops. Report it to the authorities. Report it to leadership. You don't need to humble yourself and be quiet about abuse. That's the time where you need to shout. That's the time where you need to open up your mouth and you have a church, you have a pastor that's going to protect you, that's going to take your side, that's going to help you process, that's going to help you walk through it. And I wish somebody would clap their hands and say amen. <clears throat> so, so you will not be silenced here. Amen. Amen. So you don't have to be afraid of coming out with that. Like, hey, you come out, hey, we're going to, we're going to walk with you through this. Amen? And if it's something serious, we're going, to report it. we're going to report it to the authorities. That's just facts. We just have no tolerance for that. Amen? So I'm not talking about abuse or domestic violence or uh, child abuse or anything like that. All those things need to be reported, need to be told. I'm talking about just the day-to-day -day life, dealing with coworkers, dealing with evil people. Come on, somebody. Dealing with people that don't like you. Dealing with lies. Dealing with gossip. The way you combat gossip is not by gossiping as well. Oh, I'm about to out gossip you. Oh, you got, ooh, I'm about, to, I'm about to gossip you so much. I'm about to, go ahead, how, how much gossip you got? Okay, you got it to about 50 people. I'm about to get it to 100. You, how, many, how many friends you got on Facebook? How, how many you got? Oh, he only, he only got like 50 friends. I got 1,000. Ooh, I'm about to gossip. I'm about to out gossip you. He said, no. No, Jesus just, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. All right? I'm just going to trust God in this. All right? So, so godliness is exuding, and it will affect, people will see godliness coming out of, off of you. It, it'll affect the way you dress. It'll affect the way you carry yourself. It will affect every part of your body. It will affect every part of you. Or people will feel like, hey, hold on, like there's something different about you. That, that, that's, where the, that's where Jesus messed the enemy up because because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the Gentiles, they were expecting for him to retaliate. But Jesus just let it happen. And he won. That's, that, that's crazy to me. That, isn't that crazy? Jesus is like, go ahead, take your best shot. It is finished! I won. Man, the Bible says that, that if the princes of this world had known that they crucified the Lord of glory, they wouldn't have done it. His resurrection was in the hidden wisdom of God. It was just, that, that was too, too grand for the devil to imagine. See, one thing that God always does in your life, no matter what wrong comes against you, no matter what wrong comes against you, what God does in your life is he has a turnaround in his presence that your enemies don't have access to. And God is just setting you up for a turnaround that they don't even know about. He likes to make it look like you're down just so he can turn it around and get glory. God's bad to the bone. God just knows how to do it. He just knows how to do it. But the mystery of godliness is living out Christ's principles Walking with him, walking in the spirit. And the Bible says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
You can, and, and here's the thing. Here's why it's important. And, and maybe I'll, I'll discuss this in the next few weeks. Here's why it's important. Because it says that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And he says that the carnal mind, everyone say the carnal mind. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Wow. That means to think fleshly. Right? The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, right? To think fleshly, to think materially, to think just with the carnal, barbaric nature. Giving in to every whim of the flesh. He said, that mind is hostile against me. Enmity. Everyone say enmity. Mm. Enmity. Everyone say enmity. The carnal mind is enmity. Against God, the, word, the Greek word enmity, the, when in the translation, when you look at the Septuagint and you look at the classical Greek with this word, the English doesn't really get it like God is trying to present it. Because the word enmity, it just means one-sided. That the carnal mind is hostile against God. But if you look at the Greek word, when you look at the essence of the Greek word, it was a warfare term that they used to describe enemies. That the carnal mind, it is the enemy of God. So what does that mean? That means that it's not just the mind being hostile against God, but it's God also being hostile towards you. You see that? You ever tried to do things your way so much and you got super resistant? You're like, I don't care. I'm going to bust through it. I'm going to, and it's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't care. God, I don't care what you think about it. <clears throat> and you feel something pushing you back. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm going to go serve the Lord then. <laughs> Come on, somebody. When that thing ain't moving, you shouting at it. You, you, you even try to use his name against them. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> He's just pushing back. He's just pushing. Back. It's the it's the enemy, and, and that's what it says. It says that the, the the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. And it says that the spirit and the flesh that they are contrary to one another. Meaning there is always a battle. You ever said? You ever said? You know what? I'm gonna pray at five a.m. in the morning. And that flesh said, "Sit down." He said, you know what, I'm going to start my fast today. Flesh said, you know what, I want a donut. And what did it say? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's the, it, they, they, they come back. They, they, they come back, but godliness, here it is. This is, the, this is what godliness is. It is when your spirit man overrides your carnal man. And you, your soul, is living under the influence of the spirit man and not the flesh. That, that what's inside dictates how I walk, not my emotions, my feelings, or my flesh. That's the challenge. It's, so you got to feed the spirit. What is the spirit like? He likes the fruit of the spirit. He likes joy. He likes, he likes love. He likes, he likes long suffering. He, he likes prayer. He likes fasting. So, so you got to build up. What does the scripture say? He said, build up yourselves. Build up your faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. That's why we pray in the spirit. That's why if you hear people speaking in tongues, Paul said, man, he said, man, I pray in the spirit and I pray in understanding. He said, when you pray in the spirit, you edify yourself. 
because I need to be built up to withstand the pressures because my flesh is trying to take me down. My flesh is wanting to do this, so I got to start praying in the spirit and say, uh-uh, flesh, uh-uh, flesh, uh-uh. I got to edify my soul. I got to edify this spirit man because the flesh is, the more, the more I put that alarm on, the, the more my flesh hit the snooze button. Come on, somebody. I'm waking up. Uh, it's Sunday. I'm going home. Okay, I'm going to go to bed early. Monday morning, I'm waking up at 4.30 to pray. You got your Bible out. Come on, somebody. You got, you got, your, you got your whatever. You, you've got, you got your clothes out. You got everything ready to get down on your knees and pray because the spirit man is ready, ready to war. And then you get up. And you're like, uh, 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 and you're like flesh say, boy, you better go back to sleep. And you're like, no, but, but, you know, me and the Lord had a covenant, and the flesh says, what covenant? <laughs> like, I, well, I promised to the Lord that I was going to commit more. Come on, man, you tired. Yeah, yeah, I'm tired, but, but I got to go after the Lord. Man, you got work in a few hours. I, I know, but I got to go. Yeah, but then you got to cook for the family when you get off of work. Don't you need your energy? Yeah, but, you know, me and the Lord, but don't you need your energy, though? But the Lord, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> ain't, ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? And then look at you say, well, you know, you right flesh. I better, I better just go. I just better go ahead back to bed. I just better. Flesh said, that's a, that, that's a, good, that's a good boy. Go ahead. Go ahead and lay your head down. Just go ahead. Thank, thank you, flesh. And the spirit man is crying out, feed me. Please feed me. How are you going to withstand the cultures and the things that are coming after your soul if you don't allow your spirit to override your actions? Right? Isn't that the, isn't that the daily struggle? But we pray to build up ourselves so we can handle it. And so when someone catches us off guard, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I mean, I've had people, I, this is going to scare you. I've had people try to, I'm sitting at a table, and someone, ac someone accidentally dumps a piece of food on my leg while I'm at the table. I know, this is Christian folk. Ain't that funny? <laughs> it was like a big thing. Like they look, look, look how I responded. I, I kept talking while they put it on my leg. I was in a conversation. They dumped it on my leg. <laughs> Because they were jealous of me. They dumped food on my leg. I kept talking while they put it on my leg. And then they said, oh, hey, we put it on. I said, oh, oh, man, all right, it's, it's good. So like I was saying, you know what godliness is? Nobody affects my response. You can't make me blow up. My emotions are governed by God. You can't make me angry. You can't make me mad at you. You can't make me hate you. I love you unconditionally and none of your actions will dictate my response. That, my friend, is you being governed by something greater than yourself. Come on, somebody. Because you know what the flesh would have did. Come on, somebody. If the flesh would have had this way. What's up? You really want to go. You really want to go. You really want to go. Oh, you start doing, look, 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 look you, you, you want flesh. I'm like, do it again. Do it again. Do, do it again. Come on, somebody. The, the, you know, the flesh, come on, somebody. When those unexpected moments come, it shows if you're living under the influence of the spirit or you're in, living under the influence of the flesh. And you know that guy got so embarrassed because he was expecting everybody to just kind of, you know, be like, oh. But because of how I responded, you know, it's like nobody cared. The flesh didn't get no glory. When they make sharp shots at you, you know those sharp shots? You know what I'm, those subtle jabs? Oh, look at, oh, look at him. You think he's, uh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, you think you so, huh? Oh, look, he going to pray again. Oh, look, he's spiritual, spiritual. And, you know, you're just like, oh, you're all so funny. Love you. He's like, oh, man, he ain't even getting mad at us. What do you do when you're walking so godly that you disappoint people because they couldn't make you bitter? And they try to do whatever they can. Let's make them bitter. Let's put a post about them. Just wait back. Just wait for a comment. Here it comes. Crickets. Did he get it? Come on, somebody tag him. They tag you. <laughs> He's going to blow up. You're just going about your business, serving the Lord. Because you are governed not by the flesh. You're governed by the spirit. What did they say? What did that? What did that meme say? You're about to say something, but the Holy Ghost that had somebody close in their mouth said the Holy Ghost just. That's that's self control. That's temperance. Eusebius, an inner force. That's what happened whenever Jesus got transfigured. Is this? Wave a hand if this is helping somebody. I'm going to wrap this up. What time is it? What time is it? Somebody give me the time. 8.53? 8.54? Okay. I got a minute and 15 seconds. <laughs> when Jesus was transfigured before them, the Greek word is meta, metamorpho. He got transfigured. The word transfigured is metamorpho. It's the same word that you get in Romans 12, 1, where it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing. The word trans, metamorpho. And so what, here's what's happening. When Jesus gets transfigured before him, what, what it was, it, it was his inner glory that he was always walking with. It was his inner glory that overtook his outer body. And they got to see his glory from what was within him. Not what was on him. It was he allowed them to see what was in him. That's what godliness is. When people get to see what's in you. No matter how much they poke, all they get is love. My goodness. See, whatever's in you is going to come out of you, right? You shake a bottle. You shake a bottle long enough, what happens? What's in it comes out, doesn't it? And you don't say, hey, you made me. No, nobody can make you. That was already in you. But you shake it enough. What's in you comes out. But what happens if it's love comes out? They shook Jesus in the wilderness, and all that came out of him was the word. 40 days not eaten. They shook him. If you be the son of God. They shook him. And all that came out was it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Nothing ungodly could come out. All that could come out was the word. They shook him. He got shaken up at Gethsemane with his mission and the more they shook him in Get Gethsemane he had to pray three times they shook him and shook him and all that came out was great drops of blood he got shook so much two things could come out of him the word and the blood nothing impure could come out of him God will allow you to be shaken to get all that mess out of you. Come on, all that toxicity out of you. Then he says, now let me pour in you the word. Let me pour in you my name. Let me pour in you the fruit of the spirit. So the next time you shake him, the only thing the world sees, here it is, is my image. And he said, to be It says, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are according, called according to his purpose. And then it says in Romans 8, 29, that we would be conformed into the image of his son. 
We're already in the image of God, but it's the process that allows us to be made into the image of his son. The manifestation that I may know him in the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. We're born with the image of God, but you have to be born again to get the image of his son. Okay. I better wrap this up. Let's all stand. Man, God's good. Man, I love the book. Praise God. Anybody want to live godly? Amen. It's beautiful. And we can show, he said, how can you love the father who you do not see when you don't love your brother who you do see? He said, if anyone says that they love God and hate their brother, he said, they're a liar and they have not the father in them. Ooh, that's, that's some strong Bible, huh? Whew. But man, what happens when there's a whole group of people that are striving to live godly? I didn't say perfect. I said godly. Come on, somebody. Where I'm in the process. I'm in the journey. Whew. And some of you have made some progress because a long time ago, if somebody did something to you, bro, you just had what I like to call a block party. <laughs> you just started blocking people on social media. You was blocking everybody. You were the block master. You were Bob the Builder. <laughs> He's blocked. Like, I don't like block. Isn't that block? You're just doing it smooth too, like. Now, now you're just walking in, look, man, y'all can say what y'all want. Me and God good. Me and my family good. You can't make me hate you. Come on, somebody. Isn't it powerful to live your life so much in God that nothing external can penetrate your relationship with him. That's what godliness is. You, your life is so hidden in God that nothing external can affect, affect it. Me and God good. No matter what happens, listen, me and God are good. We, go, we good around here. I wonder, anybody know how to say that? We good around here. A little, little accent on it. I, see, I have to fake an accent. I don't even have an accent. I wish I had an accent. I would just be like, you know, we good around here. That'd be so cool. My voice would sound so cool. <laughs> but I pronunciate everything. I just, just, it's almost aggravated. You know? I wish I could say, you amazing. But I got to say, you are amazing. What? Can't even, I can't even do it. I don't even sound right. If I say, you amazing, you'd be like, Pastor, you okay? Woo! I want to live for God where no devil, no situation, nothing can penetrate my relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's lift up our hands and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the opportunity to know you. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the gift of revelation and understanding. Thank you for giving us understanding in your word. We just want to be like you, God. And, and we don't feel guilty to do that. We don't feel condemned to do that. God, we just love you. We just want, we just want to express our love back to you. Lord, you, we can love you because you first loved us, Lord. And I thank you for coming to earth. And that's my example. And God, I thank you for the opportunity to know you and to live my life, uh, as a, in a reflection of your image, oh God. Lord, increase your borders, oh Lord, in Orlando. Increase your borders in winter 
Azalea Park, O oh Lord. Increase your borders in Azalea Park. Increase your borders, O oh Lord, in Altamont Springs and in Claremont. Increase your borders, O oh God, in Conway. Increase your borders, O oh God, all throughout this region where there are a bunch of people that are living out the commandments of God, that are living out the word of God, that are living a Bible-centered life. We're not living according to our feelings. We're not living according to our philosophies. We're not living according to our history. We are living according to the word of God. And Lord, we want to take on your nature and bring it to a dark world and show them that there's hope and show them that there's only one God and his name is Jesus and he's able to clean up anybody and he's able to change anybody and he's able to heal anybody and he's able to make us whole by his name. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name, can you clap your hands to the Lord one more time?